I invite you to my TEDx debut. I'm so thankful you all have come. I've been exploring, thinking everything through. Now I'm here at the podium, yeah. I remind you that E is for entertainment in TED. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so I've spent more than a decade of my career delivering stories to people. Uh, millions and millions of stories, audio form, people talking to other people, long stories, stories that the listeners um, immerse themselves into, millions of them going um, all around the world. Uh, fiction stories, nonfiction stories. Um, and so I'm going to talk some about how stories connect us. I mean, those stories represent people connecting to other people around the world with story. And songs are stories. I'm going to talk a little bit later about songs as stories. Um, I'm also not talking about stories because my name is Story, but it is a, a nice branding opportunity. Uh, <laughs> Now, um, there is kind of an opposing view on this value of stories and the enduring nature of stories. Um, we hear a lot these days about the so-called fast twitch generation. Um, what I think of as kind of the younger generation, they're going to inherit our earth from us, and they're no longer interested in going deep or immersive in things. Um, the uh, writer Nicholas Carr, in his recent bestseller, How the Internet is Changing Our Brains, uh, talks about study after study showing that when you go online, <clears throat> you're in an environment that really encourages you to not go deep, to, to have short uh, uh, experiences. Um, uh, a writer, Linda Stone, when she was at Microsoft, coined a nice phrase which I think captures this idea, the continuous uh, partial attention, continuous partial attention. Marianne Wolf. Um, a scholar was re recently got some attention because she suggested that um, reading ebooks was worse than reading physical books. She sort of elaborated on Linda Stone's phrase and talks about the multi dimensioned, continuous, partial attention uh, culture of the internet. There's a design critic from Yale, uh, Jennifer Helfand, <clears throat> who, who talks about a culture of narrative deprivation. Narrative deprivation sounds pretty bad to me. I have to say that um, in my experience and maybe yours is, you know, if you web surf, I don't know if people talk about web surfing anymore, but if, if you skitter around, after a while I kind of feel like I haven't really had a meal. I've just snacked a lot. I have the same experience when I am just reading Twitter uh, tweets sc scrolling by. After a while, you know, it's just, it's just too much. Um, mindless uh, reading of my uh, posts on my Facebook page, same sort of thing. Uh, back in the day, um, uh, we, we had something that we called channel surfing, which I think is, was even less nutritious than web surfing. Um, so I'm, I guess the fact that I feel a need to you know, have a, a full meal on occasion means that I'm not quite yet one of those fast twitch generation guys. Um, so tonight I'm going to make a little bit of a case that maybe all is not lost. Maybe the direction isn't going uh, so negative, at least um, uh, permanently. I've got a story to tell, one I hope to tell well. If I don't, you should tweet it so. I'm going to pull you into where my mind has been. I'm hoping you'd let do so. Tell me how much you know. Now, there was a time in artificial intelligence research when <clears throat> the, the, the general idea was to model human uh, brain function and reasoning and memory was through formal rule-based systems. And there was an artificial intelligence researcher named Roger Shank who ended up rejecting this. And he actually went so far as to say he thought stories was the fundamental part, thing that, uh, was, uh, that underlies all um, human cognition, that all we have in our brains are stories. 
lots of stories, that our brain is made up to index to stories, that to communicate means that I tell you a story, even if it seems on the surface to be uh, merely a factual thing. It actually, it has a whole context around it of story. And that <clears throat> to understand me means to find a story that's in your head and that close, most closely matches the story I told you. Now there's a, a writer, Reynolds uh, Pierce, um, who believes that the species, the human, uh, human species is so, it, that, that telling and hearing stories is so fundamental to the species that it is second only to nutrition, that it trumps love, it trumps shelter. Um, recently, very recently, I heard, learned about something called narrative medicine. I hadn't heard about this, but narrative medicine's premise is that the most effective way for a physician to diagnose a patient and to treat the disease is to have the patient actually tell a story to the physician, to tell their story. And only by so doing does the physician really understand who that person is and what those, what's going on with that patient. It's, that it's not just a, a, a bunch of lab results and a litany of, um, of uh, symptoms that the patient has reported. The, 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 the physician really needs to understand who that person is through the communication of story. So I'd like to, um, with that backdrop, I'd like to talk about some technology stuff, which uh, some, what I think are kind of interesting examples where technology marvels and inventions end up being appropriated to the end of telling stories. So let's talk about the telephone. Um, the, uh, imagine how magical it was that I could be in a room and I could talk and you're way far away and you can hear me talk and we can actually talk back and forth. I mean, this is just kind of amazing, never happened before. But the first deployed telephone systems were really all about delivering important information to the community. Uh, emergency stuff, important general information that the community needed to know, information back and forth between companies. If at the time that this was happening, you had suggested that people would just call other people up just to talk to them, just to tell them the story of their day or the, what they did yesterday or the story of what they're going to do tomorrow, I, I think it would have been met with a certain amount of skepticism. Um, and it, it turns out that that became a dominant use mode of the telephone system after all. And until recently when people actually quit talking on the phones uh, um, and, and using their phones for something else, uh, in fact, it was, it was what we did with the phone. I mean, we did do some, some commerce and some useful stuff. Um, another kind of cool thing, I think, is that um, just west of, well, first, in 1888 was the very first moving picture. Now, I mean, I can't, it's hard for me to put myself in this position of seeing for the very first time a real world scene animated. I mean, that seemed like that would have been amazing. It was called the Round Hay Garden Scene. Two men, two women, walking in a garden. A whopping 2.1 seconds long. That's all it was, the first known moving picture. Um, <clears throat> and even though so short, it was, I'm sure it was amazing, it was sort of a scientific marvel. But only five years later, just five years later, <clears throat> Edison, west of here, in West Orange, built essentially the first movie, movie studio, the Black Mariah where he filmed plays and circus acts and other performers. And maybe even more, more amazing, um, a few years later, in 1903, was this milestone uh, event in cinema, which was the Great Train Robbery film, which had uh, double exposure and um, cross-cutting and on-location shooting and camera movement. I mean, essentially, 15 years after this 2.1 second um, movie was invented for the very first time, just 15 years later, essentially the birth of the film industry, which I think we can all admit has become one of the most powerful, enjoyable, enduring media for telling stories. Um, now, let me talk about songs, like popular songs specifically. Um, I love popular songs. I'll bet you most of you here really like popular songs. Uh, from Irving Berlin to the Beatles to Frank Ocean, there are these exquisite three to four minute stories. They're musical stories, they're 
uh, narrative stories in text when they have uh, in, in words when they have lyrics. And so where did, what, but where did this come from? Now there's a whole history of, of, of songwriting and all that and song, but it, there's an interesting technology angle, which was, as we all may remember, Edison again, one of the acknowledged adventures of the phonograph south of here in Menlo Park. And the first phonograph systems were these wax cylinders, kind of big, heavy things and uh, players that were, the whole, the whole system was kind of expensive and cumbersome. And the first uh, deployment of the phonograph systems was, a, we might call it in today's parlance, the enterprise market. It was to go to businesses who were the ones who could afford all this complicated stuff. And it was for business information systems, maybe you know, an early an audio business information system. What's maybe less well known is there was a German um, immigrant and inventor named Emil Berliner. And in, uh, in uh, um, 1895, he patented an alternative way of recording audio, which was these little lateral squiggles going, uh, spiraling around on a disc. And it turns out that you could manufacture these discs very cheaply in, in volume. And, and essentially what that did was unlock the consumer market. In fact, Berliner was initially going to target the toy market, if, if you can imagine, the complete opposite of the enterprise market of the wax cylinder. And what ended up in the, in, 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 in the end, what we got was the 78 RPM record, about three to four minutes per side. And this now stated the format for musicians to create these little stories. And these stories have this long, industrious, industrious, illustrious history. And even today, as technology has released the requirement to stick to that three to four minutes, it's, it's still a form that we all love and we, and we go to. By now in the talk, I'm wondering what you think. Are you spacing out or feel that we're in sync? Between you and me, there's got to be a link. A story of stories, I think. I think. So let's talk about books. Books, now those are stories. Big, long stories. You consume them over multiple periods of time. They're super popular, or at least they have been in the past. Um, and there's a long history of how this came to be that, that we had books, that everybody could get books. Now, Steve Jobs famously said when the uh, first Amazon Kindle device came out that um, it doesn't matter how, how good or bad your product is, the fact is, people don't read anymore. So I, I don't think Jobs was right all the time, and I think, I think this is one case when he was not right. It was uh, al already almost two years ago that the Amazon Kindle unit sales exceeded the Amazon um, physical book sales. So you know, we all know that there's a big e-book e thing going on these days, and you know, it continues to grow. So I'm heartened to think that people are actually reading, and they're going deep, and they're going long, and they're immersing themselves in these stories. Now, in the process of delivering audio stories, I started to wonder, so in many cases, it's the same story, but in audio form, going out to all those people. And I began to wonder what, you know, back to the sort of the brain issue, which um, uh, Nicholas Carr in his book, suggests that maybe our brains are actually being altered by this skittering about and not going deep. Um, I began to wonder what's going on in the brain if you're listening to one of these long stories versus reading one of these long stories. So I started to talk to some cognitive neuroscientists about what's known about what's going on in the brain when you do this. Um, and, and in the course of doing that, I came upon a study which I think is, it was pretty interesting and has some relevance to what I'm saying uh, tonight. Um, Uri Hassan, who was a cognitive neuroscientist at Princeton, and his team did a, a study of storytelling. Now, they did fMRI scans. fMRI is this kind of a snapshot of brain activity taken in a point in time. And these days, it's kind of all the rage to have people do stuff and take scans of the brain at some frequency and then look at what the heck the brain is doing while you do that. So what Uri and his team did was they had someone tell a story, and they took scans about every second and a half of the storyteller, 
and they collected all those scans, about 20 minutes long, I think the story was. And then they had a bunch of subjects listen to the story, and they took scans of the subjects' brains as they were listening to the story, and then they lined the scans up to see what the brain activity looked like. And so on the one hand, what they saw was kind of not to be, uh, I mean, kind of to be expected. On the other hand, it sort of says something kind of significant, I think, which was that the activation patterns in the brain of the storyteller were mirrored by the activation patterns of the brain in the listeners. And maybe even more interesting was that um, they did a comprehension test. Uh, uh, they had this, the listeners take a comprehension test, and those who comprehended better, their brains mirrored the storyteller's brains better. So in some sense, you might say, you know, there's some kind of uh, mind control or mind meld going on. I think what it means, though, is when you're telling a story and you're really telling it and somebody's really understanding it, your brains are really locked and there's real communication going on there. So um, I guess, you know, to sort of end my case on this subject, I'll say, I'll, I'll note that blogs haven't been replaced by tweets. Um, the fact that we that we're interested in what the trending topics are is I think our, our desire to see the story emerge from this like endless stream of little short messages. We want something to start to, to, to emerge from it. I might even make a grand claim that um, big data is all about f finding the stories in these mounds of opaque data. Um, we really want to see a story, we want to hear a story, we want to know what the thing is going on in there. So um, I think that it may be, this is purely speculative and just my own faith position and the fact that I uh, am uh, uh, prone to wanting a whole meal on occasion, that the sort of wild malleability of software and of the internet and of data means that it may take some time, it may take more than 15 years for this storytelling power of this new medium to emerge. Um, so I will leave you with... I had a story to tell, one I hoped I told well, and you trusted with me ending so. I hope to pull you into where my mind has been, so tell me now how did go? Tell me now how did go? Don't care what I feel, wanna know now. Tell me now, how did go? Thank you.